Hello and welcome everyone to July's edition of the New World of New Biz. Now, as you can probably hear, my voice isn't quite as smooth and lovely as normal because I'm getting over COVID for the second time. Um, and I was actually supposed to be after doing the webinar this morning, going up to Madfest. Um, so yeah, for those of you that are joining us, thank you for joining us. I know it is a very busy week this week with lots of people going on holiday and also lots of people being at Madfest. But hopefully those of you that are at Madfest will be able to catch up on this later. Um, so as always, we are focusing on well in on on today's webinar everything that can help you grow your new business opportunities and actually today I guess just sales in general because we're really going to be talking about the relationships and how you can power sales not just from a new business point of view but also across the rest of your business with your existing clients as well and um, hopefully by referrals and other things so if you haven't joined us before Welcome. My name is Katie Street. I'm your host. I am also the founder of an agency for agencies is the simplest way to put it. We help actually lots of different B2B businesses now, but traditionally and mainly agencies attract and win more new clients and use lots of different methodologies to do that. And of some of those we will, of course, um, pick up on today. But with me, I have a fantastic panel of people who are going to be able to help me discuss this, especially as I'm probably likely to lose my voice today. So... <laughs> First up, I'm going to come. I'm going to come to the other lady in the room first, um, Kat. So Kat is well, fifty percent of the founding team of Imagine Insights. Um, Imagine was co-founded by Kat in 2019 alongside her business partner Jay, who actually I think is speaking at Mad Fest, if not today, That's tomorrow. That's yet over yeah. the next couple of days, um, and Imagine Insights basically is on a real mission to help. Well, brands, consumers, agencies understand Gen Z and help Gen Z uh, shape their future. Um, so wel welcome, Kat. And I'm sure you're going to be able to share lots more, not just around the relationships and uh, how you've grown Imagine Insights, but also probably a little bit on Gen Z as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Katie. Thanks for having me. Um, really happy to be here. My name is Kat Castino, as Katie said, and yes, I am the co-founder of Imagine Insights. And we are a platform for 16 to 26 year olds. Um, and we are a market research platform and we enable young people, as Katie said, to um, shape their future. And we believe the best way to do that is with brands. Um, so we crowdsource qualitative and quantitative feedback ideas, insights from our global Gen Z community. We have nearly 25,000 of them in 111 countries. Um, and we can help to uh, help a brand to shape their branding, their product, their marketing, all within 72 hours. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kat. See, I'm going to just let you guys introduce yourself today because <laughs> one, I'm going to run out of voice power and two, you, you can do it so much better than I can do it anyway. Um, so thank you, Kat. Um, next up, I have the lovely Tom. So Tom, uh, not only, well, we don't work directly with Tom all the time, but Tom is from CoEx, who are one of our the agencies that we help attract and win more new clients. Um, Tom, why don't, rather than me using up my voice, why don't you do a much better job of introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about CoEx and the Mission Group? Thank you, Katie. Yeah, with pleasure. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm Tom Carter. I am the uh, managing partner of operations for CroEx. Um, just to explain a bit of my kind of career history as to what you know how that might be useful and interesting today. Um, at the moment, my role is very much around kind of building out partnerships, the operations of CroEx. Prior to that, my role has been much more in client services and CSD within the agency, um, going back some years. So both through building client relationships. Um, pushing new business as well. And also now more recently to say building partnerships, hopefully some of what you know, I can share today might be of interest from a point of view of building relationships and, and obviously achieving referrals. Um, just to kind of give a, a few points on CroEx itself. So CroEx is the formation of uh, two parts of an agency really, one of which being kind of an integrated comms agency, which was Crow previously. Um, and then we brought in together with that um, ethology, which was our uh, CX consultancy. So it's a happy blend of both the science and the rigor that comes with CX and the creativity that comes with a, a kind of more conventional um, comms agency. So that was something we launched earlier this year and Street have been amazing at helping us to get it out there since. 
yeah, I got some very exciting opportunities already. So that, I guess, goes to show we're outside of the relationship side of things. We're helping you build new relationships, but also the power of an effective value proposition and message, which you guys have got really nailed and and you know you did that work before we even started working together so yeah well done to you guys um and last but not least of course we have the fan and oh my goodness say look as well as not being able to talk i can't actually get my words out we have the fantastic alex um now i'm going to say your name i'm hoping correctly chatterton um who is joining us at, from b q as the business development um, manager for the marketplace is that correct alex have that i nearly got that right correct yes Good. correct correct pronunciation of the name as well so thank you oh there we go um so yeah would you like to do a much better job uh, oh, yeah. i guess explaining what your role is um, yep. at b and q and i guess why relationships again are so important absolutely so yeah so uh, morning everyone so yeah as uh, as katie alluded to alex chatterton so um, I work for B&Q in the marketplace team. Now, in terms of marketplace, some of you may know what marketplace is, some of you may not. Um, marketplace is essentially giving businesses the opportunity to sell on the B&Q online platform, so DIY.com. Um, I lead business development for the marketplace. So we launched marketplace um, in March of this year. Uh, essentially, previously, we've been a traditional bricks and mortar organization with an online platform where we have buyers who buy all of our products. We've now opened that up to other businesses who have the ability to uh, essentially put their products on our site. We don't buy the products from them. We just take a commission as if the sale comes in. Um, from a relationships perspective and, and what I want to get out of today, I, I guess from my side, it's really about um, giving you guys a bit of an insight as to how I target um, potential merchants to bring on board, really maximize the day, because I think that's such an important thing, especially in a, in a world where everyone is so tied down with work, there's so much going on, and actually making sure that we are targeting the right businesses within b &Q. Um, So that gives me the opportunity to then make sure that I'm maximizing my time, I'm maximizing the, 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 the after effect further down the line, that the merchants that we're bringing on board are going to sell, and actually giving a bit more clarity around the different types of business development that we do. So whether that be through um, online forms, whether that be through social media, whether that be through uh, going to exhibitions and that side of things, which I think is a massively underutilized, um, underutilized platform as well. Just really giving a, a bit of an idea around how to manage those internal and external relationships as a part of that. And yeah, looking forward to uh, looking forward to today. Brilliant. Thank you, Alex. What a team I have with me today. Um, so, um, sorry, a few housekeeping things before I get started is, which I forgot to say earlier, please do pop um, any questions in the Q&A at the bottom. Um, at the end, I will start the poll um, just five minutes before we finish. Please do, if you're still with us, uh, take your time to fill it in. We do really value your feedback. We've got loads of really amazing poll data from over the last two years which we're going to be pulling together into a report which we will share to all of the attendees exclusively so yeah if you do fill it out that's really really handy um, and I can already see some of you saying hi in the chat so hi Stuart hi Hayley hi anyone else please feel free to introduce yourselves on the chat uh, but if you've got a question try and put it in the Q&A box because then I'm more likely to see it and I promise I will try and get it to our fantastic guests today um so um first up I I guess just wanted to kind of reposition things slightly. So the reason I thought today's session was a really interesting topic is, of course, you know, in the old world, pre-COVID, we were always only networking, really. And, and still, when I talk to people, we often talk about networking in person. And um, for those of us lucky not to have COVID, or not me, there's a lot of people going to be gathering at MADFest today um, and over the next three days to, to do that networking in person. But I think the world has you know has had to shift and make some fairly seismic changes to the way that we build relationships now and it's actually been really a quite a fun experience for me because i never thought i would be able to build relationships with people without that in person connection and I, personally i've found that quite a I don't know, a nice thing to do using Zoom. I've really enjoyed meeting people like yourselves. You know, and I, I've, although it's not quite the same um, as meeting people in the real world, I think you know, it's opened all of our eyes to how actually a lot of these channels uh, that we use do actually help you build your network and actually can be used as networking tools. So I know you started talking about this earlier, Alex. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you first on this. 
how do you like to be networked to via social media and or how do you use it when you're you know looking for people to use the marketplace or looking to you know you know from a business development point of view pull people into your network absolutely so i think there's a couple of different areas here that that, that are quite interesting so number one as a marketplace we're very new but we're also a very established business which naturally means as you launch you're not in a sort of normal startup phase. You've already got that buzz that surrounds your business, which can then be quite challenging because actually you, you, you actually probably get more inbound leads than you actually need to do outbound. So when you do get that, actually you need to maximize that and make sure that the, 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 the ones that you're talking to are going to drive the, the bottom line in the right way. Um, we on DIY.com, so DIY.com being b and website, um, have a merchant hub form, which is essentially a, a self-serve form for merchants to declare their interest within the business. That gives us a real good understanding of the amount of SKUs that they have, the amount of gross merchandise value that they that they attain, the amount of marketplaces that they're on. And that gives us a real good indication as to how we can then um, move forward with the guys that have got, well, essentially the low hanging fruit. Um, what I would also say um, from that side of things is how I how I want people to approach me is quite a difficult one because beggars can't be choosers, right? At the end of the day, any lead is a lead. So um, I get a lot of uh, requests on LinkedIn. Um, I send a lot of requests out on LinkedIn as well. Um, and I think for me, LinkedIn is a platform that has developed over the years and it probably gets a, a bit of a bad name now for people not posting professional stuff or people stealing content and that side of things. But for me, it's still a super important channel to be able to utilize as a part of the process. It gives us a real good understanding of who the right people are within the businesses that we want to talk to. Um, I think as well, we use um, external resource. So we are a new marketplace, but we there are a lot of existing marketplaces out there that currently service the categories that we want into playing. So home improvement and DIY traditionally. So your likes of your Amazons, Ebays, Onbuys, Mano Mano, which is traditionally a French business, but coming into the UK and a home improvement and DIY specialist as well. Um, we have uh, essentially a, a tool that can that, that can essentially scrape the, the the top merchants within those. Now that that sounds great on 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 one instance, but very often businesses will use different trading names because they don't want to be a part of uh, they, they don't want them their their business name to be a part of marketplace. So that requires a bit of um, a bit of work through. We don't get contact names as a part of that, so we need to build that out as well. So from my side. I, it's quite difficult to say what my preferred method is in terms of who gets in touch. For me, it's around uh, making sure that um, the people that we are talking to are going to be the ones that, um, and, and I keep going back to this, this, this same sentence, but the ones that are going to deliver for us. Um, so yeah, I'd say, I'd say in short, there's, there's not necessarily an, an ideal way, but, but certainly the different channels that we have should all lead through back into to, to making the right decision. Totally. And I think a huge part of that is also making sure that you're using those social channels to build your network in a really helpful way that you and that I know maybe is something that I bang on about way too much, but it's because it is genuinely, I think the most important thing is that if you're putting good, helpful content out into the world via your social channels, so you're building your social network and you're building relationships through social media, media by giving out helpful information that is the key to success in b2b marketing like as long as you're putting rather than just connecting with people you're connecting with them to share something or yeah. or just genuinely sharing stuff on your profile and and i do think that's another thing you in the in the b2b world you know we we want to feel like we're a business and i think last month's webinar we had um andy on from content cow and it has to be human to human so you know giving that you know, helpful, insightful, you know, social content and those making those connections via social, I think they're a really great way to start as long as you're being genuinely helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, I, th I think it's, it's different. I'm trying to, to, to word this correctly. Maybe maybe come back to me because I, yeah, I want to no. make sure I'm saying it the right way. <laughs> that, that's fine. Now, Kat, obviously you are particularly knowledgeable around the kind of younger Gen Z. Um, do we say Gen Z or Gen Z? 
so it kind of depends so yeah. yeah I mean I say Gen Z because I'm you know from London and that's how yeah. I would say it but I think yeah. predominantly the, the majority of people probably say Gen Z. Gen Z is American right I feel like yeah. Gen Z <laughs> Uh, anyway, so Gen, Gen Z, which I'm going to go with the, the English version, um, are there particular ways that they, I mean, I'm guessing it's going to be social and I'm guessing it's probably nowadays going to be TikTok, but are there particular tactics or ways that you see relationships being built through certain channels with that young audience? Because I do think it's one that's really important, certainly as, you know, the for agencies that are here today trying to connect with brands, I'm not saying that they're, you know, necessarily going to be in the c-suite and the people that you want to speak to today but I think we do really need to be aware of their behaviors and how they want to interact because they are you know they are the prospects of our future and as we can see you know people like Stephen Bartlett who in their very early you know careers are kind of rising through the ranks very very quickly often now that you know they're ambitious they're go-getters and we need to be able to start to influence them from an early age hopefully in the right way so are there any things that you can pick up on that help from a social perspective us build relationships with that younger audience yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. And also thanks, Alex, for putting something in the comments about Gen Z uh, and not Gen Z. So I agree with you. Um, it's social is a, is, it's a really interesting one for Gen Z because there we recently did a report in, in January which highlighted um, a lot of um, Gen Z taking breaks from social media. So my point around kind of connections on social is that you said it earlier, it has to be meaningful and you have to add value somehow. So the way that we, for example, as a business would run our socials is we have a different tone of voice um, for each platform. Um, and, you know, what we're putting out on, on each channel, each platform is going to be slightly different because we're trying to reach a different audience and we're trying to engage with people in a slightly different way. So for me, it's really, really crucial about that value add piece. There's no point just you know, putting something out if there's no meaning behind it. And you have to take a bit of a step back to think, what are your values? So if you're a brand, what are your values as a brand? And how do you want to connect with that audience? And the best way to connect with that audience is to ask them what they want to see. So, you know, not to kind of bang on about what we're doing as a business, but that is the premise of our business is if you ask your consumer, and you make a change off the back of that, then the relationship is going to be a lot more positive and a lot more healthy. So the way that, you know, Gen Z want to engage on social is to feel that um, there is also authentic content out there, that they are being truly represented across social media, or, you know, in broadcast media or whatever media we, we choose to talk about. But they want to see people like them and they want to see real people. And, you know, yes, brands can um, influence the content, of course, is very huge, but there is a real art for real people authenticity and to have a two-way dialogue and I think if you can do that then there is so much more scope for engaging with your audience on socials yeah I love that it is it's got to be about authenticity and it's got to be around like you say understanding the needs of your audience again something I talk about a lot but because so many people forget to actually ah, oh, especially in the in the agency world yeah I think actually b2c brands are much better at this and you know doing those interviews and you know collecting qualitative and quantitative data I think in the b2b world we forget to ask people sometimes yeah. you know what it is that they value about us or yeah. why they need us or what they need help with or what their challenges are and it's such a simple thing that all you guys can do is speak to your clients and ask them what is it you truly value about us what is it that we can help you with right now have you got any worries and then start to look at those trends and that can really help you inform your marketing and your relationship outreach because you know the likelihood is a problem that one of your clients is having may very well be a client problem but lots of your other clients as well. So that really helped. Um, Tom, I'm going to come to you next. And guys, I forgot to say this in our, sorry, you guys are getting the pre-brief brief now because usually I say to our guests, but because I joined a bit late today because I've got COVID and I'm probably going to start sweating profusely. Um, but, uh, please feel free to, to comment on stuff. Don't wait for me to say something to you. If you have got if you want to comment on one of the something that one of the other guests is saying, please feel free to do so. Um, Tom, in terms of, I guess, you know, m moving these, these relationships on, once we've started to nurture them through socials and we've got, you know, we've got an engaged audience, what kind of, you know, things have you seen being done, I guess, across the Crow Group? Um, and also, you know, when you've been working in, you know, as a um, client services director with clients to build on those relationships, what kind of, you know, 
I guess, you know, trends, insights have you got to really help us pull those those relationships a little bit more closer? Yeah, I, I think sort of picking up on what you said there, Katie, what Kat was saying in terms of you know, listening, in terms of building the relationship from that kind of initial contact, it really does come back to, you know, properly listening to what's being said and showing, you know, the kind of intelligence to be able to respond to that and not just kind of going with what might appear a, an authentic way of engaging and then default to some kind of pipeline, you know, box of content effectively. It needs to be continually responsive. So I think in terms of building from that initial contact, you know, following through on the fact that yes, being helpful, adding value, trying to pick up on what it is they're feeding back and responding to that. And then over time, as you, you know, do Brilliantly Street as well, is kind of making sure that the content is always answering a problem or answering a question um, so that you kind of retain that, that front of mind, that visibility. And then obviously at the point that they're willing to engage and they want to you know, pick up the, the kind of tempo of the conversation, then sort of being able to respond to that as well. So, yeah, it's in, in back to sort of one of your earlier questions, Katie, in terms of you know, how do I like to be kind of approached by people looking to either partner with us or from a new business perspective it very much I think it's two factors it's one if there's a, a kind of mutual contact or a mutual connection shared connection between us and obviously LinkedIn is a really useful way of you know identifying where people in common exist um, but also you know being able to actually someone who's shown the time and taken the time and interest to actually find out okay well yeah they're not certain but they've made a guess of what might be of interest to us so I think it's all too easy when you know, in that new biz mindset to sort of you know, be stuck in the agenda of I need to get leads. I need to, you know, you've got the targets, you've got the and actually stepping outside of that and saying, I'll put that to one side. Actually, what's important to these people is and then obviously trying to align that back to what you have to offer. So it sounds very basic saying it, but I think it often gets forgotten, especially in social, where obviously the temptation is to automate and just go crazy with all the tech. And actually it comes back to some really sort of human practicals actually so true you've got to bring the human element in and you've got to look at sorry I keep butting in saying I want everyone else to talk and then I keep going ah I thought of something um but you've got to you know people think about getting the leads in they then have a meeting with someone so they've not they spent all this time nurturing a relationship to the point that they start a relationship they actually have a meeting either nowadays on zoom or in person once they've had that meeting they then stop and the relationship stops and they forget to nurture that person because I thought this was so interesting. When Andy came on last week, he mentioned a very interesting stat, which I am now banging on about all the time, which if you remember this one thing from today, then this is the main thing to take away. Only 5% of any B2B audience on average are ever looking to buy your services or products. So 95% of the people that you're trying to sell to, if you're taking a more old school approach to set to sales, do not need you at the time that you're reaching out to them. Fact, done. So if you're only trying to sell to them and then you have a meeting and you don't talk to them again, most 95% of those people might need you in a year, two years, three years, six months, one month. If you forget to continue to nurture that relationship, you have lost all of the hard work that you did to pull it in in the first place has gone. And that is why relationships to me are so important. You know, marketing helps pull people in. Marketing can also help you nurture those relationships if you do a good job at it and you continually do it. But also, I think you're so right, Tom, you've got to have that human approach. You've got to you've got to pick up the phone. You've got to ask them, you know, if you've got a really good prospect or someone that you've built a relationship with that you genuinely think that your business can help and might, they might need to buy from you in the future, you need to really work hard on that relationship and nurture it and be friendly and helpful and send them things and ask them to meet for coffee. And you know, there's so much more that goes into this, that it, you know, building relationships in order to you know truly help people and hopefully sell your products and services there's a lot more that goes into it than just purely getting a lead yeah I, definitely Katie and I think you know, the point you made there in terms of there's a lot of hard work often invested to pull in that lead in the first place and actually if you're if you're letting it drop off you don't get that kind of cumulative effect of you know once it starts to kind of build up the momentum and actually you know, retaining contact and staying staying visible for the time when in the, yeah, the rest of it, they're actually there with their need and they're there and they're wanting to actually speak with you. 
yeah, that in itself doesn't really take a huge amount of work. It needs to be done systematically, but it could be quite infrequent. It's just just enough. And obviously, I'm sure we've all been on the receiving end where you you, know, you have someone who gets the lead and then they're just kind of onto you every day with emails. And it's like that. That's just a big turn off also. So it's yeah, getting the tempo right of that communication, I think is so key. Yeah. Totally. We have had a question in from Alex. Hello, Alex, and thank you for your question. Thank you for being so active in the chat as well. Um, Alex has asked, what are your pro tips for nurturing a new business relationship with a partner? Um, Alex, can you just in the chat pop some more context on that? What I'm thinking you are meaning is, um, and this is a real trend actually that I've seen with lots of agencies, is a partner as in not a prospect but a partner that potentially has the same audience as you that you're either co-marketing or referring leads into and out of and we were talking a little bit sorry to come back to you again Tom um but and I'm sure you've all got comments on this but of course you know Crow are um part or Crow X are part of Crow group which within the group has around 150 people and I think five or six different ages agencies is that right maybe oh, more five, I think now, yeah. okay five I did get it right almost I, I I spread my bets there and then of course you know on the the wider scale you're part of the mission group which has a lot more agencies within it and around about a thousand staff so how do you proactively work on those relationships with your partner agencies and I guess any other tech partners to get the you know, I guess, get the most out of the referral opportunities that you might have? Yeah, and thanks for the question, Katie, because I think you know, we're probably in slightly unusual situation with obviously a group within a group. Um, yeah. And, you know, it does take time to kind of you know, work out how best to, um, you know, to leverage that and to engage. But, you know, it's really quite, quite again, quite basic in terms of how we've um, dealt with that, both in the sense that you know, becoming known within Crow Group and making sure putting on roadshows, going out and touring what it is we have to offer and picking out those agencies within the wider mission group, which there's 16 agencies um, globally, whereby there might be, you know, a natural synergy and making an approach and saying, look, we'd like to share with you what we have. Can you do the same for us? And just really familiarizing yourself with what's out there and hopefully, you know, keeping people aware of what, you know, what your service proposition looks like at any one point. And then just giving named contacts again, it's so basic, but it's just saying, if you have the slightest question, just pick up the phone and speak to us, you know, we'll soon try and guide you and, you know, be really helpful. Um, and that's where the, the mission group, you know, is, is a big benefit to us because you know, rather than going out to open market and trying to find a partner you know, in the wider world, and obviously you then have that kind of courtship process actually with a mission group, you know, you're part of a trusted network. And you can kind of almost bypass that first stage and go straight to, okay, well, what's the project about? What's the, what's the need or the problem in this instance? And just kind of accelerate the, um, the conversation that way, really. Amazing. Um, Kat, have you, uh, well, I'm sure both Kat and Alex, you're both going to be working with other partners in a similar way. Any top tips for Alex? I mean, it's from, from our perspective, it's, it's about, <laughs> you know firstly you have to provide a good service right so if you've done a good job with someone and you've got a good relationship with them that your hope is that, that they would then talk about you and so it, even going back to a previous um, part that you were saying is about that um, just really nurturing that relationship and not forgetting about that person and then that builds that trust with people so from us it's about you know not being so we we might have people that are doing similar things but not being scared of those competitors um, and also you know sharing learnings wherever you can without giving away too much information is something that we've learned as well um, but also just asking you know if you are like I said doing a good job but you're also a nice person and you're also professional but people are you know trust you there's no harm in just asking and reaching out for a contact and I think often we can be quite scared of asking questions because we think oh well what if they say no well what if they do say no you know you've at least you've tried <laughs> so I think yeah. you know just saying oh would you mind connecting me with this person um you know could you if people ask me for a recommendation I'll say yeah no problem but what would you like me to say you know if there, is there something particular you would like me to put into that introduction email um but also if there's someone that I don't feel comfortable introing um you know because maybe I don't have that relationship where um I think it's 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 um going to be a beneficial connection then I will also put my hands up and say that so I think for me it's it's the nurturing piece but also just being really honest and also just yeah going for it and asking the question yeah I think just to add to that as well for me a big one is 
expectation alignment so making sure that what both businesses want are aligned with each other i think you can get very often get caught up in the day-to-day and and it's very much just i want this and they want that and actually if you're coming together to start with you're getting a much better understanding of that so that you can both work towards a common goal as well which sounds a bit cheesy but 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 it's true right i think um one of the biggest biggest challenges that i have um working in the marketplace team is the hidden motive for a lot of merchants is that essentially they want to be in a b and q store so it's right well i i want to come on as a marketplace merchant but actually what's the buyer's name etc cetera, etc cetera. and actually i could quite easily give it to them but it's just going full circle in the sense that the reason that they're joining the marketplace is because they can't become a first party merchant or certainly in the short term actually we can use marketplace as a test and learn functionality to understand if, the, if our customers do want that product and then further down the line but if we're just passing stuff on to the buyers they're going to pass it back to us they're going to be pretty annoyed they're not really going to get anything out of the back of it the merchant is going to get pretty annoyed because i'm passing them on something for no reason so actually managing that expectation up front to say listen this is the process ideally what we'll do is we'll bring you on board as 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 a third party merchant let's test it let's see how it works if that is working if the sales are coming in absolutely let's open up a conversation with our with our buyers but in the short term that's not something that's possible because unfortunately we don't have elastic shelves in store we can only fit so many products in there which then means that actually the the buyers have got to make decisions based on what they know not based on what they think they know actually by utilizing marketplace as a channel we can build up our insight of what not what we think our customer is but actually what our customer uh, either of the future might look like what we've seen within some of our categories that we've launched within marketplace and we've launched in categories that we already play in so lighting as an example our average item price for a marketplace lighting item is 50% higher than for our first party business. So actually what we're already learning is we've got a much more affluent customer. So then that then builds into what the future looks like. And then we can align with those potential merchants to, 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 to let them know, well, actually, these are the products you should be focusing on. And then that's how we can facilitate the conversation with the buyers further down the line. But for me, it comes back to expectation management. And if you're up front with them, then there's there's no gray areas of, well, you said this or you said that. Yeah, and understanding those challenges again, isn't it? You know, I think what you said right at the beginning there, Alex, is you know, you've got to be so I'm gonna read out Alex your comments in a minute, but you've got to be, you've got to approach these things in a way where you're being really, really clear that you understand whoever you're trying to pull in what their challenges might be when you start that conversation. I think that is, you know, you've got to be talking to their needs and going, do you know what? I understand. I have this problem too, or actually, I think I've got the you know solution to this problem. How about we have a chat about X, Y, or Z? So, Alex, you have said um, da, 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 currently searching for new partners that are in different industry to ours. So this is quite bespoke, but I'm hoping it's going to help lots of people. Uh, currently searching for new partners that are in different industries, in di- different industries to yours. So you work in app development. Those businesses might have clients that might want apps, but they might be able to build them, and we want them to refer us you know, the people that need the apps and you want to be able to you know, refer to them, people that potentially need marketing support. And I'm guessing that probably, Tom, happens quite a lot within your agency group. So I would say there's a few different ways to approach this. First of all, if you are doing any cold outreach, you know, to start to pull those people in, really position it around you understanding their challenges and making sure that you're being very very clear about that I'm in business development I'm trying to you know attract to this I know you're probably trying to do the same I've got some leads that I'd like to give you you know and and I'm sure you might have some that you you want to give me could we have a chat now it's really hard when it's cold so I would say my biggest tip here is to utilize um, marketing agency networks as well. If you're an independent agency, which I'm guessing you might be, if you're if you're specifically being challenged or you've got some challenges around the, the referral side of things, is there are some great groups out there where you can go and meet people, great places that you can go and meet people. There are then you know attached Slack groups, etc., community groups. So the places that I would recommend that you go to start having more of these kind of community chats and joining events, etc., would be um, an independent agency group called Pimento. Um, they actually do this, but they will get you, you'd have to pay a referral fee. So you join Fomento as a member. You can then build your own network of agencies within that you do refer to and they take they take 5% and you lose 5%. So it costs you, I think, 10% or something. But anyway, so 
platforms like or not platforms networks like pimento that can help you do this kind of stuff there's also fantastic networks like bima i was at bima beyond last week got two new business leads no three new business opportunities actually not even leads um off the back of attending that so show up to industry events do the, you know be brave enough to go and do that in person networking and and start speaking to people about what you do because you know more often than not when you do do that in person it does accelerate the opportunities you're know, coming to life a lot more quickly um and also a free one and there are various different groups on there that you can join that i would highly recommend for anyone joining if you haven't already is guild so guild is um a marketing community stroke forum platform um we've got a an area on there for our Tambor members at the moment it is closed and only for Tambor members but you know take advantage of those industry because those are going to be warmer relationships and going to some of the virtual and in-person events that they do will just help you have those conversations more quickly but you know understanding and positioning that you want to help them and that you've got similar challenges I also think is a really good starting point I don't know if anyone else has got some tips for Alex sorry that was a very long uh, explanation there from me. Probably the only other thing to to add is it's um, make it make it a sort of win win and a value exchange. You know that you're working with multiple partners at this moment in time, rather than sort of asking for 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 something from them. Actually, offer them out and say, by the way, within my industry, I know that one of my clients is looking for X. Do you mind if I pass on your details? And that that actually opens the exchange. And I know that that's not something that comes naturally. They also, the, the, the client that you're working with has to have that need essentially. But if they do, actually that's a really good uh, entry point to say, I'm willing to share. You need to reciprocate essentially without necessarily saying it. So I get it quite a bit within um, within my role around things like, businesses who don't have direct to consumer capability so they can't fulfill to the end customer so actually they need third party logistics to be able to support them with that and one of their first questions is alex what three pls are, are, are businesses using at this moment in time i will then more than happily share some of the businesses that i think are best in class there but then actually my expectation is to go reach out to the three pl and say by the way i've passed on your details to x business have you got any other businesses that you're working with within my particular categories that we can potentially look at onboarding? And then it becomes a value exchange rather than just you asking for something or just you offering something and it makes it more of a two-way process. Love that. Great tip. Really great tip. So we did touch a little bit on, I keep banging on about Madfest because I'm really jealous that everyone's gone there and I can't go. I mean, I probably could go. My day five is today, so I could be let out from tomorrow, but I don't actually feel well enough to go. So that's more annoying than anything. Um, so uh, going back to these in-person events, I have absolutely loved it, by the way. But then, you know, I I love meeting people and that's why I do the job that I do uh, to a certain extent. So has anyone got any top tips? Because it is it can be really, really awkward. And I'm also lucky because I do the webinar and I, we put a lot of content out. People come and approach me, so I don't. I don't always have to be the one to go up to people and you know, have if you're going to a networking event on your own, it can be quite daunting. Has anyone got any top tips for if you do attend and you're starting to go back into the real world, attending events, not just networking events, just an event that you could be networking at on how to you know strike up conversations with people? Yeah, I can take this one first. So I, I will be luckily at Madfest. Um, so sorry not to see you there, Katie, tomorrow. Um, but and and it is, you know, it feels very strange to be doing all these things in person. But I also I also really enjoy that side as well. Um, I think for me, there's the first thing is when you go, you don't have to always think I'm there to sell. Um, or I have to get a new business lead from this um, and I think you know being open and just going and kind of be, just being around and you know whether you're going to a panel talk or whether you're just sort of experiencing if, if we're thinking about Madfest it's just an open space where you can walk around and see lots of people but if you go in with you know I'm not it's not just about new business it could be that you meet someone and you have a conversation which is you know you just being you um, and that's really important as well and there's perhaps three things that you might want to say in a, in a conversation that relationship might not 
you know, transpire into anything immediately, but you could connect with that person on LinkedIn or ex exchange contact details. And then you might end up speaking to them, you know, in, in a year's time. Um, and it comes back to that whole thing that we've saying around nurturing relationships. So I think it's, you know, being yourself is so important, not thinking you have to sell straight away, but also having something in your armor, which is, you know, what, what do I want people to see? You know, how do I want people to portray me? Or what do people, what should people know about me and perhaps my business? And then, you know, do you want to make that connection afterwards? For me, it seems, you know, I often connect with LinkedIn uh, on LinkedIn right there, but that's just something that works for me. But then I will always, always follow up. So if I've met someone, even if it is just to say, great to meet you, um, you know, happy to stay connected, something like that, just then puts in a really, um, a really personable way of connecting. So yeah, they would be my, my tips and just being, yeah, true to yourself. Such a top tip and so true. Like the worst thing I think that I ever felt when I was, and I've always worked in sales or marketing roles, probably, and even in marketing roles, I've kind of been, you know, on the experiential marketing team or in, you know, teams that are kind of more, I guess, on the, you know, on the salesy side of marketing. And it's, you know, such a pressure that you're kind of told by your boss, you must go, you must make this amount of connections, you must sell, sell, sell. I want you to come away with five opportunities or whatever. Rubbish. I, I mean, I've got a whole team of amazing uh, campaign success managers and our new biz manager who are at Madfest. I haven't given them any targets like that. We have said to them, look, we want you to go and get loads of knowledge. Of course, we want you to go and get those connections, but you shouldn't feel under pressure to sell something to someone because if you're going in with that attitude, it totally can mess you up. It, you're, you're under pressure. You think, oh my gosh, I've got to sell them something. No, you, you've got to be there and be helpful and enjoy the day and soak up the knowledge because there's so much, you know, the sales will come afterwards. Occasionally you might meet someone and they might go, oh, I really want to, actually, I really have a, that problem. Can we have a chat afterwards? You're not going to sell them something on the day. So don't, I think that that pressure can almost like just ruins the whole thing. Go and soak up knowledge. And you're so right. The other top tip that I have that Kat, you've kind of, it said that you do there quite naturally which is great is make sure you follow up really quickly straight away on the day or the next day you know not well not even the next day on the day when you've met them try and connect with them straight away on LinkedIn and send that follow-up message really lovely to meet you loved hearing about da 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 um wasn't this talk amazing or whatever it might you know you, a relevant conversation to what you were having with that person make it personable make it real because the next day two days later the next week they're on to the next thing so make sure that you're doing that follow-up because like I say relate it's about relationship right you, relationships aren't just a one-off meeting you've got there's got to be lots of post you know post meeting engagements to make those relationships valuable and helpful to both of you because at the end of the day that's what we're doing this for to help each other you know that and that's what we have to see it as it's not about selling it's actually about helping us but you know you've got a product service that you need to help grow and you, they've got a problem that 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 you know thing that you want to sell them hopefully is going to fix so you're both helping each other that's that's how I try to position it I, I think just to back up on what's been said there Katie I, I think you know if you if you're going in with the the mindset of needing to sell stuff then you you cause yourself problems because you're kind of locking yourself into a way of handling any conversations and you're inflexible that way actually almost leave that agenda at the door and go and set yourself the, the mission of selling nothing <laughs> and be surprised at how, you know, how much might come out of that. Because if there's a natural opportunity to mention what it is that you offer, it will come up anyway. Um, you don't need to force it. So I think exactly as, as Kat said there, um, the only other thing I was going to say in terms of a tip, if it's a, an event like Mad First and maybe you, you know, struggle Wednesday, you feel a bit awkward, actually, you know, set some prior meetings up. So if you're meeting three or four people, straight off the bat, people that you're already in contact with, you know, it just sets you on a roll that you can then go into other conversations and you just, you know, your, your kind of social anxiety is broken down by that point. So you can kind of just roll into other conversations far more naturally. Thanks. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, just, just to add but to, to both of those, and I think Tom and Kat both make great points. I think Tom around the existing meetings, I think that's a, a really, really helpful. And I think, from Kat's perspective around the LinkedIn piece, that, that's something that I'm massively big on as well. The other the other one that I would consider, and I, I got burnt by this quite recently actually, is around doing your due diligence in advance. Actually, you might not necessarily, or your ambition is not to sell, but at the end of the day, that's what you are there for. So actually understanding the businesses that are gonna be there, 
understanding the contacts that you want to make contact with whilst you're there. And then actually on the back of that, when you are approaching a stand or you're approaching a business or something like that, you've already got, uh, I guess, a bit of a, an idea about which is the person that you want to speak to within this business. And this might not necessarily be as relevant for, for some of the agencies as it is for myself, but working in the e-commerce sector, I know that the big people that I want to speak to is either the dedicated e-commerce resource that they have within that business or someone very senior within that business. So actually approaching the stand, when you get to that point of that sale, there's no point me speaking to an in-store marketeer if, if my overall ambition is to bring somebody on board from an e-commerce perspective and they can they can facilitate that by telling me, but they're probably going to want to know a bit. And to maximize your time, going back to my piece around making sure that we're making use of our time at all times, actually in the back end, if you've already got that sort of preconception around, right, I need to speak to this person at this stand, this person at this stand, and if they're not available, then how do I get their details and something like that? That for me is something that, I mean, luckily it was a two day event. Day one was a car crash. Day two, I managed to bring it back a bit, but but that was, that, that was pretty much because I hadn't really done my due diligence in advance. I knew who was going to be there, but didn't go as far as, right, these are the stakeholders that I wanted to, to approach. And stakeholder management, again, for me is absolutely key because there's no point, so there's no point. There is there is, there is is less chance of, of, of bringing somebody in if they're not the key stakeholder that makes the business decision within that. So actually understanding that in advance can then get you into a much better place and, and get it get you in that better place a lot quicker if you already know who you need to engage with. Yeah, that's so true. And, and you know, it's it's the upfront planning pre going to. I'm calling them a networking event, but they're often not networking events. Either. They're just events where you're going to network. But the upfront planning and doing your research is so important. And there's some really clever things that you can do. Like if you, like you say, if you know there's certain people and there's certain job roles, you start to look at them on LinkedIn. LinkedIn and some people have lockdown profiles, but probably like two percent of people on LinkedIn. You can follow people. You can see what they're posting about. You can see. You can start to get an idea about the things they might be interested in and the challenges that they might have. And if you go up to someone and you say oh um oh actually I follow you on LinkedIn I saw that you were going to be here today and that you'd said you've posted recently about this I find that really interesting as well you find some common ground to start your conversation that's you know have being prepared is going to really really help you and understanding you know I mean don't want to be, look too stalkerish but I think LinkedIn does enable us to do this and say oh I also saw when I looked at your LinkedIn that you worked at, you know, this place. I've got a friend that worked there. Oh, you know, find, finding those commonalities to break down that initial conversation is really, really helpful. So doing your prep work, I mean, don't come across too stalkerish, uh, but I know one of you. I know you um, but yeah, but make sure that you're prep. It's good. I was just going to add to that because like, the due diligence piece, I think, is so important, but it could, it's anything from... You know, let's think about any any business that might have multiple parts within it. So, for example, um, you could say uh, Pizza Hut. I'm just going to throw that out there. Now, just understanding that there are two separate parts of that business, i.e. there's a delivery side and there's the restaurant side, even down to stuff like that is so important because you could go in and go, oh, yeah, I know all about Pizza Hut. But, but do you, because they're different parts of the business. So it's just, there's little things like that around that due diligence piece that you can do um, that I think will massively help you. So sorry, just to add on that. <laughs> yeah, love it. Love it, love it, love it. Gosh, really, see, look, it, it, this always happens just before the end, you get really passionate about a certain subject and we start riffing about it. Um, Edis has asked a question. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping again, I'm saying your name correct. Edis, Edis, it, tell me if I which if Edis or Edis is right, first or second. Uh, what are your thoughts on building a personal brand than selling to your community? Um, I mean, if it's done in an authentic way, I don't see it as a problem personally. Guys, what are your thoughts? Anyone got any specific? Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I think if you, if you, as you said, Katie, if it's done authentically and you've got the resources to follow through on it, it goes back to what we were saying earlier about generating a lead and then being able to nurture and convert it. If you, you know, if you're committed to it and you have something that's interesting for people, then absolutely, why not? Yeah. I think that's the that's the key. You actually think of it, it's like a lot of you know tech startups or you know apps you join for free. Like, you know, I mean, this is a really bad example. Well, no, maybe it's not. Actually, dating apps are quite a good example. Dating is quite a good 
example of a relationship that you have as a you know between a brand and an agency or within any kind of sales cycle to be fair but if you think about you know a dating app for instance you you go you join it for free and you start to realize it's helpful and then you upgrade to a premium plan to unlock more you know things and that's basically what you're doing if you're building out a community and you're giving you know, usually in those community forums people join them because they're helpful they're able to connect with other people that have got insights or tools or experience or referrals or something that is going to help them do their job better um or you know deliver for their business better or whatever it might be so as long as what you're then selling to them doesn't feel to you know, I don't like being sold to because I'm a salesperson but I'm probably one of the easiest people to be sold to well I don't know that be easy to be marketed to maybe not easy to be sold to so I think as long as it's done with authenticity and what you're selling is truly helpful to your audience then I don't see it as being a problem I think you've just got to position it in the right way and it not be too salesy just you know doing it authentically it it can work that's basically what we do for all of our clients with street and what good marketing is you're building a community you're pulling people into your marketing funnel you're giving them insights helpful information you're feeding them case studies you're telling them about how you can help them and then you're trying to get them to buy something so in theory that is how good b2b marketing works um we just don't always call it a community but that is basically what what we build out yeah that's what we're doing for crow and that's what we do for most of the businesses we work with we're building them relationships with the brands and the you know people within those brands that really need their help and then we're trying to sell them their products in a very subtle nice friendly helpful way <laughs> so yes I would say is the answer to that um and Alex right we've only got seven minutes left so I am definitely going to try and come to your question uh what are the biggest red flags that you've seen or experienced with someone trying to make cold contact with you oh wow I'm sure everyone's got good ones on this <laughs> mine is just the barrage of emails um you know I think Tom highlighted it earlier and you, know, you just get the same email from the same company and yes you can unsubscribe but with information that just isn't relevant. Um, red flags like getting your name wrong. You asked, a, you were great, Katie Ellie, because you um, asked a few times, how do you pronounce your name? You know, if someone says that, and if, if you've been asked that question, and you still get it wrong. That's a massive red flag for me. Um, if you're, you know, think simple things, it sounds so, so silly, but getting the name of the business wrong, um, not tailoring an email communication, you know, they are basics. They, yeah, that, that really frustrate me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think a couple that sort of um, you know, going off what you said there, Kat, the tone, as you mentioned, it's kind of, you know, if you're trying to, um, you know, hit a tone that's sort of reflective of what the person's looking to receive, you just don't know that if it's a cold outreach and actually it's trying to strike proper balance, obviously, between kind of, you know, being business like in the approach and also not being overly friendly too quickly. So I think maybe that's just a personal thing for me, but that that can be as off putting. Um, but I think also it's gone back to a lot of what we've said throughout in terms of listening and making sure you understand the problem before you attempt to try and solve it. Yeah, so often you'll get people who are um, cold emailing or cold uh, LinkedIn messaging where they, they're making big assumptions about what it is that you're having a problem with at that point in time. And that's that's a bold thing. And sometimes they get it right, of course. And, you know, you can obviously win from that equally. I think there's a lot to be said in actually just approaching and saying, look, I, I really don't know what it is that your problems are right now. Not these words, obviously. And I'd like to have some of your time to find that out and then start to customize your approach and response. So I think trying to sort of guess too much and solve too quickly can also get you wrong as well. Totally. Anything to add, Alex, any really annoying approaches that you've had? One one that I hate, I'm going to just jump in with mine first because I'm cheeky like that, is when people sort of go, oh, you haven't responded to my email. You haven't responded to my email. I'm like, well, I didn't ask you to email me in the first place. So that's why I've not responded because... I didn't want you to email me like I hate that and as soon as someone does that even if the first email was quite good and I do often try to you know I get quite a busy inbox as I'm sure everyone here does so I do try and respond because you know I work in this industry I do try and respond when I feel it's a good one um but if as soon as someone starts going oh you haven't responded to my email I'm like well no because I didn't ask you to email me in the first place so do one no I had that that grates me that and I hope that we never do that because I don't think we ever do to any of our because it's just it's in a kind of accusational and I know why they're doing it there's some psychology and science behind it but I personally it just feels like a bit of a trickery 
nasty approach to make someone feel guilty for not responding when they didn't ask you to email them in the first place. And I would say don't do that personally, but maybe it does work for some people. Yeah, I've, I've seen more and more of that case actually, and to the point where they'll say, yeah, this is the last time I'm going to email you. It's, you know, if you don't email back now, then you've lost your, yeah, and it's it's kind of becoming more and more um, used. It's not a great tactic, I don't think. No, no. I mean, there is there are funny ones and there is some really good reports out there. You obviously you do need to go on a bit of a, if you're doing these kind of prospecting emails, you need to go on a bit of a journey. But I just think be very clear about your messaging, who you are as an agency, who you are as a person, who you are as a business and make sure that your messaging aligns and it's not being too narky. Yeah, it comes back to what you were saying earlier, Katie, about you know, only 5% of businesses are in the, the space where they need your services right then. So try and align to their agenda as opposed to yours, which is to obviously you know, sell something quickly. No, that's not what they're about. And that's why relationships and nurturing journeys are so much more important than short span sales prospecting journeys. Because even a sales prospecting journey, they say, what, nine, 10 emails, and you're sending those roughly out weekly you're speaking to that person for nine or 10 weeks before you go, they're not interested. But they might be interested later if you had a longer journey with more helpful, insightful in, in, you know, content rather than just trying to sell to themselves to themselves to themselves to them over a nine, 10 week period. So that's why we take a very different approach and it's more about building relationships um, and you know, being helpful than it is that kind of sales approach. Alex, sorry, I was about to come to you and then we I chatted away. I'm very good at doing that. Anything really bad out there that you've seen that you would advise not to do? And whilst Alex is talking, I'm going to launch the poll, guys. So please do uh, vote away. No, from, from from my side, it's probably pretty aligned to you as, as well, Katie. I guess I'm, I'm coming from a, a slightly different perspective that the majority of, of, of people that I'm speaking to are, are businesses that that either we want or there is some, some commonality between us. I think... Um, Probably my my biggest bugbear around everything, and this this wouldn't necessarily it's a red flag, but an appreciation of time. Um, I think there's there's a, a, the majority of people on this call will have busy schedules, and and for me, less around the the the, the cold calling piece, but more around the double emailing piece. That I, I when I open a business relationship with someone, my expectation of them is that if they haven't emailed me back, that's because they haven't had the time to do so not because they're ignoring me. And, and I, I sort of, my expectation is that's reciprocated, that if I haven't gone back to someone, it's not intentional. It's more the fact that I haven't got to their email or I've got something on within that particular day. So I would, I'd say it's less of a red flag, but that's just more of an observation from my side and, and from personal opinion. Uh, I feel like, it, especially if you've got that existing relationship, sending a, a follow-up email, um, and especially if it's within a short space of time is something that I'm, I'm not a massive fan of, but again, it's not, not, not a massive bugbear, but just adding something slightly different to the mix. Yeah. Personalize it as much as you can as well. I think that that's so true. Be, be helpful. It's all about being helpful. So I hope we've given you guys lots to think about. Um, certainly the networking in person um, piece seemed to be the one that we all got most excited about so maybe that's something that I need to make sure we talk about a lot more and we do again um, a big thank you to everyone who's attended today I know you've all exactly like Alex just said all got busy schedules so I do really appreciate you all being here today if you do have any questions that we didn't get to please feel free to put me an email um, also do check out Tamba so Tamba is um, so I run the, an agency for agencies, which is street agency, but also Tamba, which has lots of this kind of content on there um, around how to build relationships, pitching, anything that you need to scale up your business and teach your internal teams rather than having to work with an agency like us to do it. You can learn everything you need to do yourself. There's loads and loads of hints, tips, partners, etc., that you can access via that platform. So that's Tamba, T-A-N-B-A, the art. But the Art of New Business? No, the Agency New Business Academy. I've just renamed it. Uh, there we go. The Art of New Business Academy. Uh, the Agency New Business Academy. Um, do go check it out. I'm going to end the poll now um, and I will share results. Um, so they should pop up on your screen if any of you are interested in having a quick look. And um, otherwise, I hope to see you guys here again next month. Um, it will be the first Tuesday in August. Um, I don't, can't remember what the subject for next month is, but I'll be following up with you all by email very, very soon, just like I've told you all to do to let you know what it is. But have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and I'll hopefully see a lot of you again next month. See you soon. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. You.
拜。